On this episode of Glowing Up Asian, we talk to Katie Sue, chairman of the board of Asia Society, Southern California. Her globe origin story started with a passion for the arts and eventually led her to build a career in entertainment. She's held leadership roles at many companies that you may have heard of, like HBO Max, Hulu, Warner Brothers, DC Comics, and now Dice. With the increase in Asian American representation that we're seeing today, we look back at what it took to get there, what needs to be done to sustain this momentum, and reflected on the positive impact it's already having on the kids growing up today. Hi, everyone. This is Glowing Up Asian, a podcast where we break down the stereotypes and expectations about what it means to thrive as an Asian in America. I'm Daisy Kong, and today I'm joined by Katie Su, who's the chairman of the board for Asia Society Southern California, as well as the newly minted chief business officer at DICE and an active voting member of the Academy of Television Arts and Science. Katie, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. So I'm really excited to talk to you because when I was doing my research um, on just your background, I saw that you really had created some of like major entertainment companies and like HBO Max, DC Comics, as well as Warner Brothers. And it was always at a time when we were seeing an increase of Asian American representation that we hadn't seen before. So really excited to dive into that. But before we do, I wanted to go back a little bit in time and kind of learn a little bit about your glow up origin story. And so to kick things off, um, first question is, was it always your dream to get into the entertainment industry growing up? It was not always my dream to get into the entertainment industry. As a matter of fact, <laughs> my first dream was I wanted to be a painter and an artist at the discouragement of my family that was like, you'll never make it. <laughs> it will never happen. <laughs> um, I decided that, you know, a lot of my skill sets were in communication. I liked working with people. So the natural route there would be, you know, be a lawyer. And so I actually did a lot of pre-work to uh, get into consideration for going to law school. And it wasn't oh, until... Wow later on in life that I decided, you know what, I really don't think this is for me. And that was a result of going to internships and really understanding what it was like to practice law. It wasn't like the TV shows that mm -hmm. used to be. It wasn't like any of that, um, that I decided, you know what, maybe it's not for me. <laughs> and then from there, my path splintered <laughs> into the arts. Was it um, your parents that had hoped that you would go into a career like the law and that's where the idea came from? Or like, what was their dream for you? You know, like when you said, I want to be an artist. Yeah, you know, I consider myself very lucky because um, both my parents, for the most part, like really encouraged just curiosity and learning. And as long as I was happy, they were happy. But I think when you come from an immigrant background and you're realizing the American dream, a lot of times, you know, happiness is structured around stability, having a stable career, being able to not worry about the things that they had to worry about. And so I think a lot of those values were instilled in me very young. And naturally, I gravitated towards careers that represented that less so that my parents wanted me to do it. It was more that they knew mm -hmm. what it was like to not grow up in a world that was easy and simple. And it was just very unstable. And so all they wanted for me was stability and happiness. And so when you found yourself on this career path, and like we had talked about, is you really got to see the rise of like Asian American representation in the media. And from me on the outside, I see I could see like a lot of people within the community just really rallying around the idea of representation matters. And now today we are seeing a lot of Asian American characters as leads and we're also seeing Asian American stories being told. And so I'm curious, like being more of an insider, like what was it that allowed this to happen or like what were the impetus to like making this happen? I think a lot of it started with people being in rooms where the decisions were being made. A lot of times the only way change can be progressed is if the people in the room were championing the change that could be anywhere from development to marketing to producing the content. You had to see that represented throughout the whole entire life cycle of a project in order for those things to realize its potential. And so when I joined Warner Brothers, I actually was very fortunate because I joined an incredibly diverse group. Many people there really championed women and diversity. And so a lot of ways it was already happening and I was fortunate enough to come into a moment in time where my voice really mattered and the decisions I made 
ultimately had a positive impact and therefore the change was starting to occur. But it absolutely starts with the rooms where the decisions are made. You shared with me too that one of the reasons why you joined DICE was because it was the diversity, inclusion, belonging was always part of the foundation of the company. And that was like very different than the many other companies that you had worked for before, where it was very much like an internal movement to like get more people involved. Yeah. You know, it's so true because when we were talking about this topic, it really made me consider all of the different stages of my career. What did championing inclusion mean? What did DEI mean for companies? A lot of times, you know, especially with recent movements, so much of it is like a checkbox. I want to do DEI and that's that. I knew in my heart because I'd always been the person championing certain things or people or communities or groups and representing the other in the room. I knew that the next place I would go to, I did not want to fight that fight anymore. Meaning not that I wouldn't represent all of those things, but that I just wanted to go to a place where the culture naturally already had that movement in place, that they were already thinking with a diversity oriented mindset, that they were already looking at you know, community oriented strategies. And it wasn't something that you would go in and like educate and change and, and push. And so when DICE came along, there is diversity at every stage of the company, you know, from the board, the leadership team, to the people working across every single team, like that was a huge change for me. And I think a lot of times it's because I, you know, most of my career was in tech and entertainment and in during an era where the change hadn't happened and then it happened and it was happening. And so it was always like different stages of it that made me feel still othered in a lot of ways. But this, this company was different. I didn't feel any of that. I felt that I could come in and actually just do the things that I came to do because it was already built into our DNA. It can definitely make a big difference. And I'm glad that you found a place that does that. It's super um, rare. So, <laughs> and I realize that. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so what would you say is going to be important? Like we've seen that like a increase in like disrepresentation across the board, but like what is going to be needed to sustain that in the long run? I think what is going to be needed to sustain the representation we see today is the continual push to be the change that you want to see in the world, right? I know sometimes it sounds really cheesy, but who I am today is I want to be at a place. I want to be with people where I can be my whole self. I can bring my heritage. I can bring my culture. I can be a woman. I can be a mom. I can be all the things that represent my identity and my true self. And I can be comfortable and vulnerable in sitting in that power as me because I'm in a room where that is welcomed and accepted and celebrated. And so in order for that to exist, you need those rooms to exist. You need the people in those rooms to celebrate who you are. You need leaders who actually see that as a part of the DNA of a company. And you need products that support that, you know, business outcomes that support that. It is not difficult to say and see that our community represents an incredible wealth of buying power, as well as just like the ability to drive economies at scale. So how would we not recognize the value of them from a business perspective, let alone in a leadership team? And so I think as long as we continue to pipeline in great talent, great people who continue to champion these things at a company, that change will only get better over time. And what advice would you have for parents that are raising that next generation who are seeing that increase of representation? And they're going to be feeling a lot more encouraged than anyone in our community from maybe 20 years ago to like pursue a career in the arts, um, to pursue be an actor, to be a filmmaker or any of these types of careers where in the past, like it was very common, I think, for parents to say like, it's just not a career path for you because like you just don't see it and like, they're not going to be accepted. And, like they kind of know that um, and almost want to protect you because they know like you're going to be up against so much more. And so I'm curious, like, what would you say to parents that like, you have a child who's a budding star and they just want to pursue it? Like, what would you say to a parent who has a kid like that? What I would say to a parent who has a kid like that is that you should just do it. What is maybe my opinion and slightly different than some of the people you've talked to is I've seen the progress and I've seen the change. You can feel the momentum. There has been a shift across leadership rooms and everything across the board, right? Our content, our stories are getting made, who we are getting spotlighted. At many points, we have created those platforms and rooms to do that. Like 
age of society is a big part of that. You know, we champion a lot of diversity in stories. We honored everything everywhere all at once last year. There are opportunities in forums that we continue to drive that narrative forward. But I'm of the very optimistic and positive mindset that that change has occurred. So if you talk to a lot of younger people, they don't really feel the way that maybe an older generation feels, which is like, those rooms weren't made for me. I never saw myself reflected in it. It's going to be so difficult. You ask younger people and they go, no, I, I see myself represented. I see myself in social media. I see the people who look like me telling my stories. I feel comfortable. I feel a part of the community. And a lot of that is because of the work that's been done to date and the, the shoulders that so many of us stand on. But that's the reason why we do those things, right? We do those things so that parent can look at their child and say, you want to go into the creative arts industry. You want to be a filmmaker. You want to write a story. Go do it. Dream as big as you can possibly dream and go change that narrative and change the room for someone else. Because the only way we can continue this progress is if we keep doing what we've been doing. And that means getting to some normalcy with just being a part of culture. It's no longer about, oh, I have this dream and it's unobtainable. It's, I have this dream and I'm going to go achieve it and I'm going to make it better for someone else who comes behind me. That's amazing. And I hope many more parents hear that message. I think becoming a parent changed a lot for me too, which is being able to, to see the work that I'm doing day in and day out in my own personal life, you know, trying my best to create rooms and open doors. It truly does make a difference for their lives. Like it does make the world a more inclusive place. And so as long as we continue doing that work, I truly believe we can get to a place where we don't even have to ask that question, that there's no doubt. There's no like, can I do this? It's just mom, dad, I want to be an artist. And that is all, mm -hmm. that is it. And from there you just become an artist. Like how beautiful would that world be? It would be amazing. So I wanted to shift a little bit to talk about some of the nonprofit work that you've done with Asia societies, Asia Women Empowered, and specifically like the initiatives to foster more mentor and mentee relationships. I think this kind of ties back to like when you open doors and when you open doors to bring more people in, then that kind of has a ripple effect of then creating more um, representation in different roles. And then they then bring in more people like themselves. And like, there's this uh, positive ripple effect that happens. And what about would someone wanting to break into industry where they're not well represented, or they don't have any connections, like find that mentor mentee relationship? For those who are starting in their career or are from a perspective of a mentee, I think you have to find organizations like awe. So with Asia Society's initiative, um, Asian Women Empowered, a lot of it is because we decided as a group of women that we wanted to create rooms that people could share in our stories and we could support each other. And we knew that it wasn't just about the most senior level, which is breaking you into a boardroom, breaking you into a leadership position. We knew that you had to sponsor someone's career in the very early stages. So how do you help someone who has never navigated the complexities of a certain industry before understand what it's like to work in that field, to shadow someone who has the experience, who, somebody who's essentially walked the path that you're trying to walk down. We created a mentorship program where we do pair people together from the same industry, as well as from different levels. And we encourage that relationship to sort of blossom on its own. And I always talk about the difference between mentorship and sponsorship, because there is a stark difference. There is a very positive world where there's the mentorship and mentee relationship. But what really makes a difference is if somebody is sponsoring your career, like the sponsorship of your career. And that's essentially somebody who's willing to take you under their wing and show you the ropes and more importantly, help you at every stage of what you're encountering. If you are going up for a promotion or you're competing for a promotion, what do you do? Can this person actually give you the proper guidance so that you understand what it is that you need to do to navigate that complexity? The other piece of that is how do you do it as an Asian woman? Because the piece that nobody talks about is you always assume that it's just easy. You know, when you have a mentor who's done it before, is CEO of a company, is super successful, and he's never walked a day in your shoes because he's not an Asian woman. And again, mentors can come in all facets. I've had incredible mentors who are men, but I do think that when you're young and green and just starting out in your career, having somebody who is also like you, who comes from the same heritage, who sees the world 
the way that you do, but more importantly, the world sees them the way that they see you. I think it makes a huge difference in helping you navigate how to grow and develop in your career. I couldn't agree more. And what about in industries where there's not at many representations, like you mentioned, like you've had mentors who are not of your background in an industry, let's say that where you don't necessarily can't find like that perfect match of someone who has your same background. How do you even go about that? Because I, I think what Asia Society is doing is like really fantastic that you are connecting people to do that. And it's, what do you do in industries that just don't have that infrastructure? Well, you, you network, you go attend events. Like we host a lot of Asian women empowered events. We bring people together. We create the room where friendships can blossom, where relationships can emerge, where a lot of people may find cross industry support. Maybe you're in FinTech and you meet somebody in entertainment. And although the industries are different, your experiences may be very similar. And I think that's the difference of like seeing the world as an Asian woman and being in a room with Asian women you already are connected through that foundation of truth, like who we are, our identity. As you build on that together, you can more or less get a lot of support that will help you navigate the areas that you need to. I actually mentor and sponsor quite a few people. And I do really try hard to make a commitment to like carve out time always to be there for them. And they are not all from my industry. And I think that that is what is powerful about being able to influence the next generation is you almost can't always focus on your industry. You have to drive positive impact in areas that may not have representation, like you said. So how do we change that? How do we build up somebody who has such high growth potential to be that next generation of a leader in the biotech industry, for example? Like how do we give that person all the tools that they need so that they can be successful there? And maybe along the way, they become that person for everyone else in that industry because there was no representation. Then I think we've inspired that change and that change will only continue because now that person is driving the next wave of leadership for that whole entire category. That's really powerful. With Asian parents, there's a lot of emphasis on oh, they want you to get good grades, they want you to go to college. And it's very much like these skills that are very much about accumulating knowledge, not necessarily the soft skills. And so what advice would you have for helping children like build the sauce they need to like to network, to build connections, to build relationships, which isn't going to be found in a textbook? You know, I always go back to curiosity and maybe it's because that's a reflection of who I am. I love learning new things. I love learning about new things. If something doesn't work, I want to solve it. I want to fix it. And I think it's that thirst for wanting to always learn more and be more that puts people on that path of making themselves better, like personal growth. The stereotype that uh, Asian parents are known for is that they really want you to get good grades. They really want you to learn a lot, but maybe draw from that the best things, what it is that they really want you to do. They really want you to learn. They really want you to be well equipped to face this world. And they really want you to pursue your own curiosity. And I think if you have that trait, then you can ultimately become unstoppable because whatever comes your way, you're always going to be curious to figure out like, how do I navigate this? How do I fix this? How do I get myself, you know, past this barrier? This doesn't work at this company. Like, how do I go and make that change? That, you know, area of the business doesn't have representation. How do I go and drive that change there? Like it suddenly forces you to put yourself in uncomfortable situations. That curiosity combined with that tenacity to do that will create positive change. And so I always try to look at the fact that our parents didn't have the opportunities that we do. It was a large part of why, like from an immigrant background, the sacrifices that they made allowed us to be here today. And so, you know, not every family is the same and not everyone's story is the same. I know like my grandmother sacrificed a lot so that my mom could give me a shot at an education. And so knowing like the generations of incredibly powerful and inspiring women that I came from, I represent them in my pursuit and my journey. I wake up every day and I think, you know, if something is a challenge or something is hard, I think about what my grandmother encountered, like in a war-torn country, like in what she endured. And this is nothing. Like I have an opportunity to learn and be curious and just 
pursue a better life and then make the lives of those around me I care about better. And on top of it, inspire another generation who will do the same. I mean, that is the greatest gift that I could possibly have. And so my encouragement to parents is encourage your children to be curious, encourage them to learn and encourage them to fall in love with learning. Because I think that is the difference between feeling like you're forced to do something and feeling like you are empowered to do something. And I've always felt empowered to do that. And that is something that I really want to continue to instill in my son. And hopefully other parents will do the same because that's how you make positive progress and change in the world. You make people fall in love with learning how to make things better. Love that. Love that so much. So we're nearing the end of our conversation. And I want to bring it back to glowing up Asian, which for many of us meant feeling a little split between two different cultures. And so when you grew up, like were your parents intentional about uh, making sure that you had a strong connection with your heritage? I was very lucky. Um, I always felt very connected to my heritage. And a large part was being raised by my grandparents always speaking the language. I read and write Chinese. I practice calligraphy. I was the North American champion <laughs> for calligraphy, like, but I loved it. It was like art, right? It was like the pursuit of art, the pursuit of learning about my background, my heritage and my culture. In a lot of ways, I think my glow up was embracing my identity. Because when I was actually growing up, you go through a lot of insecurities as a kid, right? You're grappling mm -hmm. with feeling as though you have a foot in both worlds and you're not sure which one to pick. And I think as I got older and I got more seasoned in life and I've had some life experiences, you realize the best thing to do is not to pick which world you wanna be in. The best thing to do is to embrace the fact that you're from two different worlds and allow that to just live and breathe into who you are as a person. And I think it's made me better. The fact that I can see the world from a different facet the fact that I, you know, can read news from another country and that pop culture and music, like I grew up listening to Canto pop, K-pop, you know, J-pop. I have heavy influences of world music and I think it's awesome. And that makes me in a lot of ways more empathetic. I see the world differently. I enjoy different cultures and foods. I celebrate diversity. A lot of that is because I have a dual identity. The older I've gotten, the more comfortable I've become with that. What's been really inspiring is seeing younger generations doing that already. I've seen like younger kids grow up South Asian and they just wear saris to school. I mean, that's beautiful to be able to do that in what I used to call American school. I went to American school and a Chinese academy. It just honestly felt like two different worlds all the time until one day they merged. But imagine a world now where you can actually learn Chinese in school because they do immersion programs all the time. So you already have the environment where this is encouraged. It's just about embracing it and bringing your whole self to work, to school, to your friend circles. Like the more we can just accept and love who we are and what our parents made us to be, the more we learn about each other and our culture. I love that. And it actually was like answer to my final question was, was what is your hope for the future now that we see so much more representation? <laughs> and I think you answered that already, which is that more children today are just growing up embracing their culture. And I agree with you. I hope that that continues. Yeah. And I mean, I can even leave you with this. My hope for children in general is that this isn't even a topic that we don't even have to have these conversations anymore because everything has just changed. When I was growing up, you used to always think about the differences of people, like me bringing my lunch that was obviously culturally different and how people would perceive me. Wouldn't it be awesome to just not have that conversation at all, that the differences just didn't exist because it was normalized? My hope is that the work the generations have done before us and that we continue to do, continue to uplift all the things that are important to us so that one day our children live in a world where all of that is normalized and they no longer have to carry the torch in the way that we have. I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much, Katie. I love having our conversation. And so thank you also for sharing your story on Going Up Asian. Yes, thank you for having me. <laughs>